This is the RPG Crawler, and welcome to another Shelf of Many Things, where I take a look at independent and small press role-playing games and RPG accessories. This week, I'm taking a look at a bit of an odd one. A sort of tabletop RPG that includes collectible cards and dissolvable mini-games into its mechanics. Nemesin RPG. Now, in late 2019, I was contacted by the developers about this one, which I hadn't actually heard of prior, and they were kind enough to send me the box set to review. It took me a little while to work my way through the material, partly due to scheduling and partly due to the nature of the system itself, which can be a little bit quirky, to say the least. However, Nemesin RPG does appear to be a labor of love. There appears to be quite a bit of work put into it, which will become clear when we go over the systems themselves. But first, let's take a look at the box set. Nemesin RPG actually comes in a few formats, and you can buy various versions of the core materials depending on your needs. And if you have a larger number of players, packs of cards suitable for different sorts of characters are also available separately. The box set I was uh, sent appears to be a first edition version, still available on their website as of this recording, and as always, I'll put a link in the description below. The box itself is fairly high quality, built with durability for storage in mind, and with the number of contents within it, that's actually a pretty good thing. It comes with a standard set of polyhedral dice. They're a fair quality. I've got no complaints here. Uh, you've got your standard D4, D6, D8. You've got two D10s, one of them with a tens place uh, marking, which uh, is uh, nice to have. You've also got a D12 and a D20. Pretty standard stuff, and they feel passable to use. There's also a one-minute hourglass timer, uh, which is not something I've seen distributed in an RPG very often. I guess it would be useful, uh, especially in this system. It's actually part of the core rules, but in other systems it can also be useful to have. Uh, there is, you know, a marker, at least mine came with a marker, and the uh, reason for that will become clear because there are also some uh, laminated sheets as well as two decks of hero cards, one suited each for a different build of hero, mage and warrior. Then uh, there is uh, the uh, portrait card sheath, which is used for rogue skills. You basically have a stand-up uh, tab on the back, and then you put individual cards therein. Uh, there is a laminated uh, map of Horsemere, which is where the first adventure is set. You've got a, a small laminated tactical uh, grid upon which to play battles out. You have a laminated battle sheet where you can uh, jot down uh, the relevant statistics for the various monsters that your uh, heroes face, as well as uh, their general order of actions. You've uh, got a laminated vital hero sheet, which is where you can jot down the uh, specific statistics that will come into play for your various players. I, I honestly think that's actually kind of very useful to have regardless of uh, your system, or at least here they give it uh, in a way that it can be reused. There is also a, a non-laminated character sheet, which is sturdy enough to make copies off, and it'll uh, go ahead and... Uh, sustain some use, although you probably won't want to use this one directly. Instead, keep it, you know, keep it to make your copies of. A uh, dice shield is offered with a, a number of preset tables and quick reference charts on the interior for use during play. Uh, I'm not entirely too convinced of the quality of the connection there, but I guess it'll do as long as you're careful. Uh, there is also a uh, kind of uh, forging a hero uh, quick book, which has all your quick skill references for use at the table spelled out within. Very handy to have, so you can have that on hand without having to flip through the main book. In terms of actual full books, the box set contains uh, The Village, which is a starting adventure of... Uh, just over 30 pages. It comes with a, a removable interior, so you can use the uh, back in an old-school style format. It's uh, got your interior layout 
uh, pretty high, pr pretty decent quality on the interior layout, uh, full color, at least such as it is. Uh, you also have a large book with the actual rules itself, the core rule book, A Hero's Journey. Now, uh, the majority of this review is going to focus on A Hero's Journey, although I will touch upon the accessories thereafter, at least the, the adventure, uh, and I will touch on other things when they pop up during use. The main book is some 160 uh, full-color pages set in two columns, much like the adventure itself, with occasional inline artwork and occasional full-color uh, pieces. The artwork seems to be largely a public domain or creative commons in nature or otherwise freely available artwork, some of which are actually artistic classics. Uh, it's all fairly well chosen overall, although it gives a somewhat disjointed feel to the design at times due to the fluctuation of the quality of some of the pieces. As you can tell, there's inline artwork there from uh, the classics, and then you've got uh, some from other sources, and the mishmash of sources does kind of give a jarring feel at times, especially if you uh, transition from a realistic one to a less realistic one, but... I suppose it can't really be helped. They are chosen well enough. Uh, a Hero's Journey uh, does have sidebars with examples set aside in differently styled boxes. As you can see, you've got your special. Uh, you've got up here, you've got various cultures laid out in their individual boxes. And uh, in some areas, you've got notations which are uh, in different colored boxes, optional rules in yellow, examples in pink, and then uh, explanations and examinations of play in a kind of gray with uh, tabbed corners. It's not too bad. It sets them apart from one another, although it does look, it does make things look a little, a little bit busy in some pages, but that can't be helped. Uh, you also have snippets of cards and other accessories in the book, so you can uh, determine what they look like. Uh, when they're used as as examples in the rules. A Hero's Journey has seven main chapters. An introductory chapter, Forging a Hero, which covers character creation. The Living Hero, which handles the basic rules and skill use. The Living World, which gives a basic overview of the setting of Sarant and the various things you can find there. Outlaws, which covers rogue-based characters and the rules necessary to use those skills. Combat, which covers the combat system. And finally, magic that handles spellcasting. The introductory chapter starts with what you'd expect an introduction to both the game as well as the world of Sarant to contain, which has a, you know, a, a, default, a default sort of feel to it. Uh, this is not the first game that I've covered that mingles its own setting with the rules, but this one's interesting in that a lot of the setting-specific background material is actually available on their website as a sort of digital library you can reference, which I think is a pretty solid way of doing things. Of course, after the intro, this is followed by a quick overview of the book itself, much as I'm giving here, as well as an example of gameplay. There is talk about some game specifics, such as dice and such, Fate is basically what the GM is called in this game. Uh, there's a description of the challenge role, which is a basic mechanic of the game overall, as well as details on what scores to use in a challenge role when the character has multiple values. Nemesin uses a roll under system, but has a special table for results of 20 during combat, which can result in a variety of unpredictable effects, both good and bad. Hero cards are described next, and Nemesin uses cards to represent a variety of aspects of the game, from magic and certain skill use to special effort and moves undertaken in battle and even inventory. Cards are not drawn randomly, but rather held in a constructed deck of a certain number of cards that is also used to represent fatigue and other aspects. For instance, Active equipment cards are limited, and cards that are used in battle or to resolve other situations are not replaced in the hero's deck until after they rest. Certain situations during gameplay can actually force a player to discard cards from their hero deck, representing general fatigue and exhaustion. The chapter continues with a general discussion of time, guidelines on role-playing, and a reward point system, which 
are used to boost a character's skills and abilities. This is used in lieu of leveling, although the general legend system attracts the overall hero's power level when necessary. The main section concludes with an examination of base points, which are used to increase character's skills and an overview of what can be increased with them. Basically, how to translate reward points into the boosts into those particular attributes, abilities, traits, skills, and so forth. The next section, Forging a Hero, goes step by step through the process of actually creating a player character, called Heroes in this game. After a quick example character sheet, it covers races. Each race has a race itself, and then the groups or cultures that that race can have. You choose the race, and then the culture within, kind of like sub-races. The main races each grant very general details, an attribute modifier, one or two uh, trait penalties, while each group grants a free skill, base scores and abilities, as well as a number of base points to distribute, as well as possible starting languages. In addition, some groups have a real-world culture that they are modeled off of, and that is listed here as well. An interesting point is that although many of the races of Sarant are analogous to classic fantasy races, a few of them have been renamed and had their own cultures added. As far as races go, there's the humans, there's uh, the Hushel, or Half-Elf, there is uh, the Hoffen, which is a sort of halfling, there are Halorks, or Half-Orcs, there is uh, the Nymph, there is uh, the Dwarven race, there are elves, and I believe uh, these are called Thane or Thin, which are sort of caveman style creatures. After the races and groups, the basic attributes are listed, as well as what effects that they have. There is strength that affects what sorts of items can be equipped, how much a character can lift, how fast they can move, and how hard they can punch. Agility impacts their overall accuracy with attacks the speed they act, and how quickly they react. Charm impacts their favor with the gods, how readily they may adjust their others' perceptions of them, and how easily they can try to subdue a target outside of combat. Finally, there is intellect that governs how they perceive their environment, how many languages they can learn over time, how accurate they are with bows and missile weapons, and generally how finely tuned their senses are. There's rules for rolling these four attributes, as well as a basic array that can be used instead. The section on abilities and traits describes each in turn. Abilities are generally passive things that are used for defense or to endure the world around you, while traits are more active, used to affect the environment. Abilities use endure, or the physical and mental toughness of a hero, heal, or their healing rate, absorb, how much damage each area of the hero can absorb from attacks, resist, the hero's ability to resist other effects, Mana, which is used for spellcasting, and finally Favor, which is how favorably the gods look upon you. Traits, on the other hand, include Action, or how quickly they act in combat, Move, or how far they can move, Senses, which is basically Perception, Attack, which is a general attack accuracy, Archery, which is ranged attack accuracy, and Punch, which is the damage you do with barehanded attacks. Each of these traits and abilities has both a base number and an adjusted running total. After this, you can uh, distribute the base points given uh, by a character's race, and there's tips on what to do for a particular character build. There's no classes in Nemesis, so you can build your character pretty much however you wish, although there are certain bare minimums you'll want for particular builds, just for survivability's sake. Following this are backgrounds, and there are nine of them in all, each of which represents a hero's background before they became an adventurer. Each of these defined a number of skills that are considered primary, and you can boost four of these skills with some starting points. However, you can also refer to these backgrounds during play, depending on the adventure. After this, heroes choose a backstory, which is more for role-playing purposes. They pick a title, which again is mostly for role-playing purposes. If they are known for something, and then they go ahead and get starting coin totals, which are used to buy gear during an adventure. Interestingly enough, gear that you start with as cards from the player deck are not really required to be purchased this way, so coinage mostly just fills out the gaps. You can also pick up a basic description, figure out the hero's patron god from the list of ones that are, that are available, fill out their starting legend, infamy, and honor. 
Legend increases as a hero goes on adventures, while Infamy and Honor kind of almost represent an alignment system. There's no real alignments, but rather anything you do that stands out can give you Infamy, Honor, or in some cases both. The total of them is capped out, so eventually they'll max out and then you'll start having to trade one for another based on your actions. It's actually kind of neat, honestly. After the basic character is done, there is guidelines for deck construction for a couple of builds. And uh, this is where the collectible card game aspect of the game comes in, is there's a maximum number of cards in each character's deck, but otherwise they can really assemble them pretty much according to taste. Although there are a couple of general decks included in the box set, there are other decks and specialty packs available on the site online to fine-tune a character's selection of abilities. The Living Hero section is next, which discusses the general rules of the game. It starts by discussing setting the origin of the hero, or where they come from, how they learn languages throughout the game, and then the hero's legend, or how it increases with each adventure, as well as how the exhaustion system works, which basically boils down to the hero's deck dwindling over time and then possibly leaving them unable to put extra effort forth unless they rest to recover cards. This is followed by uh, the movement system, as well as a starvation rules and rules for resting, including a few different sorts of rests that can restore different numbers of cards. This includes camping rules, which use various camping gear cards to increase the efficiency of the other rests, and rules for broken rest, or what to do when the rest is interrupted. There's some rules about deadly advantage, or what happens when you're unable to defend yourself, and trust me, it usually sucks. Skills follow, which include not only how to use skills, but also a list of skills as well as how to improve them. There are descriptions of each of them on the pages that follow. Now, an interesting aspect of Nemesis RPG is that many skills grant a ability, a flat bonus, or a bit of knowledge simply by investing in them, even if you don't actually use the skill, and honestly it doesn't matter how much you invest in it. Anyone who invests in Forage, for instance, gets an additional move point. Anybody who invests in Pugilist, for instance, gets their punch value increased by one. It's an interesting way to give little bonuses to people who take skills, and I kind of like that. Some of these skills do offer a choice of multiple actions if you're trained in them, and some can replace some more general actions in combat or exploration, thus making the hero much more effective in that one particular thing. After the skills, equipment is gone into in more detail, covering equipment cards first and how they are equipped. Certain equipment can give bonuses to skills, abilities, or traits, or even alternate scores for various aspects that are used instead. The PIP system can limit what gear you have equipped, basically telling what part of the body it covers or what hand it's held in. This can result in some armors being able to be stacked with certain others and so forth, which is a neat system to handle it that allows some armor to be stacked while not others. This section covers armor, then standard gear, followed by weapons, shields, and then arranged weapons, all in all. Each section has uh, a list of some pretty standard uh, gear that you can find within it. The Living World section follows, and this gives a general overview of the world of Sarant and its cosmology. It should be noted that this only gives the very uh, basics of general description, starting with the seasons and calendar, the cosmology of the night sky, general descriptions on the realms of various social structures, military, and then what services can be generally expected to be purchased in what areas, as well as rules for retainers and hirelings, generalities about the law, transportation, and so on. More specific details around each rare area of the world can be found on the website, as I mentioned before, in the uh, setting library. So this very long distance view of things can be a good sense of the world without getting caught in the nitty-gritty details. This is followed by a discussion of treasure, including general coinage, gems, jewelry, and even land that can be picked up. There is a section of rules on traps as well as poison and then disease. The poison and disease rules are pretty similar to one another, although they have their own distinct quirks. There are four alternate worlds in the Nemesin cosmology discussed in the section of the gods that follows, each of which is associated with one deity. 
Aside from these four main deities, there are occasional demigods as well as avatars that a group can encounter wandering around. The recipes rules follow, and they provide basic guidelines for creating items, alchemical creations that can create various effects, and so on. It basically involves a completion rate for both the recipe and the item that accrues after various actions are taken or things are uncovered. This is followed by rules for rituals, relics, and magic items, which can be represented by cards. The general rules for playing and running monsters follow, although specific examples of individual monsters are not actually given in this book. Instead, they are represented by monster sheets, which are available elsewhere. The guidelines are given on reading these monster sheets, including what powers to let them have and what wealth they can carry. Each monster has its own subset of stats that can act like a miniature version of a character sheet and may have their own small deck of cards to use in combat. A section on monster battle skills follows, including the various major powers that can be common to multiple monsters that you encounter. The next main section of the book is on outlaws or the rogue type skills. This is where the portrait card system comes into play. Each rogue skill has a, a different card, such as picking locks, dealing with traps, picking pockets, pilfering, hiding, and sneaking, and each one has a different kind of minigame associated with it that can be solved during what's known as a quick turn, or what you use the hourglass timer for. These are all different and may vary based on difficulty, and they're solved with a mixture of tools and gear, or in uh, some cases by simply solving um, a uh, puzzle through sheer mental effort on the part of the player. The rules for combat follow. Combats take place in combat turns, but each player only has a quick turn, or one turn of the hourglass, to decide on what to do, which does keep things moving, especially in slower groups. Combat follows an order of action which is determined by character action values, so pretty static. Each character can take only one of several options during their turn, moving, attacking, casting a spell, readying equipment, leaving combat, etc. Attacking in melee does include being able to move a little bit as necessary, although anything more than half of your movement requires a full move action. This is sort of reminiscent of the general guideline from old school role-playing games, so you know, that's pretty easy to pick up. Otherwise, combat makes heavy use of a tactical grid. Combat isn't simply generic roles, but can also include effort cards that represent various uh, battle moves and feats that can be experienced in battle. There's rules for dual wielding, unarmed combat, subdual rules including grappling and other special combat rules, fighting in water, using cover, that sort of thing. There's even uh, mounted combat rules. Ambush rules are pretty extensive and can be very beneficial if set up correctly. The combat system in Nemesis RPG tends to be rather high impact, so tactical advantages can make or break a particular combat, and characters who successfully set an ambush can really profit from it. As a point of example, the damage rules actually include unprepared damage, perfect strike damage, and perfect shot damage, each of which has an entirely different table of modifiers and effects that can be rolled while striking unprepared opponents or opponents who are engaged with others. These can also be triggered with certain effort and skill usage. The final chapter of the hero's journey is magic, which details the magic system as well as how to read the various magic cards. Rather than static spells, you create your own spells out of components in Nemesin. Basically, you state what you want your spell to do and then build it out of various generic cards with a calling, an energy card, a destination card, an effect card, a delivery card, and a duration card. Some of these cards may be stackable in certain instances, and each one offers modifiers on how much mana and the actions taken or various other aspects of the spell. At the end, you kind of total all up to get what the spell costs, how long it takes to cast, and any modifiers to the rolls needed. Different spells have different power sources. Some types of casting cards are faster than others, although less efficient in terms of mana, and these all combine in interesting ways. The various energy sources are described in this chapter along with their modifiers, and some are better at producing lists of effects than others. It's up to fate to decide whether certain effects can even be cast with certain energy types. Trying to heal with energy fire or energy evil, for instance, may not be the best of ideas. The broad types of effects that can be produced are described here, too. And that's 
pretty much it for the main book. Of all the other stuff in the uh, box set, the adventure is really the only other one that needs to be looked at in depth, as the rest are just playing aids and quick reference. The adventure, called The Village, also by the system author Roy Burke, is an adventure for new characters of less than five legend. It has an introductory adventure sort of feel set in the village of Horsemere. The contents are in a booklet with a folder-like cover, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, basically it's got an old-school style to it. There's a glossary of terms that a character would know about the area, followed by the content in two-column f- color with descriptions set in box text and inline monster and NPC stats where necessary. The adventure is basically a sort of murder mystery, with the characters arriving back in town after having uh, taken a uh, bad turn on a prior expedition, only to have a murder occur while they're there. They are then set to solve the murders, such as uncovering any other plots in the village and so forth. It is both a keyed and a timeline-based adventure. Each area provides different information as the uh, adventure proceeds through time, at least if it's keyed that way. And eventually other occurrences will further plot development if the adventurers haven't solved the crime by a certain time. There are a few threads running through the plot that can allow for multiple endings, including some bad ends. One thing that sets this apart from introductory adventures I've seen in other systems is that there can be a programmed adventure feel to certain parts. That is to say, certain areas will direct you to other entries later in the book, which can lead to others sort of like some sort of hybrid choose-your-own-adventure style thing, although exploration of the village itself is pretty open overall. Fortunately, this is somewhat limited, present just enough to make it interesting without feeling like the adventure is completely on rails. In terms of challenge, it's not a half-bad adventure, and does a good job of mixing thinking and problem-solving with combat, especially considering how brutal the latter can be in this system, and gives a pretty good idea of how to use various skills and combat abilities in the system. So, here's the big question overall. What do I think about Nemesis RPG? Well, in terms of presentation, it's, it's decent. Aside from some early print problems, the books are colorful. Art is well chosen, as I mentioned, although I do have some reservations about certain particular pieces. The included material is handy, especially with the quick reference aids, and I'd like to see that in more box set. The laminated material is uh, really uh, n- nice to reuse over and over. The cards are decently produced, about par for what I'd expect of an indie collectible card game. About the only thing I have an issue with, aside from the art, from a technical standpoint at least, is that the Hero's Journey book needs an editing pass pretty badly. But then, I say that about most RPGs I review, and it's rare when I find one that doesn't have erroneous word usage or typos here and there. They're definitely noticeable within this very version of uh, Nemesin, although they aren't bad enough to really detract from the system. It's like, mostly just the next time that they put some sort of revision out, I would suggest taking a long, hard look at the stuff, because... Uh, you, you know, it's not necessarily just this system, but I see it often. When somebody's working with a material for many, 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 many months or even years, you kind of gloss over things and don't really check them. And, and I think it could it could use, like, an editing pass. Of greater concern overall were uh, some organizational issues. You know, there's specifically, there's various traits, abilities, and such, and they're introduced in line as you create the character. Nemesin RPG does well enough to cover things in an order needed for character creation, but the traits, abilities, attributes, etc. are often referenced before they're properly introduced. I feel like perhaps a page of quick summary or glossary might be helpful up front. Otherwise, I find myself flipping back and forth through the book during reading, and I, I guess that's just nitpicky on me, honestly. In terms of lore, I honestly think that the world of Sarant is the best part about this RPG. The fact that most of it is put aside for access via the website is really useful in that you don't necessarily have to grab a bunch of splat books in order to find it all out. It does a great job of presenting an old-school feeling, a gritty world that mimics an historical kind of feel while still preserving fantasy elements, and that should really be commended. I know how hard that can be to do. Mechanically, each individual subsystem of Nemesin is pretty interesting. I enjoy the point-based advancement that allows for classless builds. I think the combat system, with its focus on tactical combat that rewards disabling opponents quickly or otherwise setting up advantages, as well as the additional rules on how the natural 20 event tables work and the perfect strike tables, etc. work, 
Since some of these entries can add more to combat than simple damage exchanges, including equipment damage and so on. And this is even before you add the ability to play various cards during a combat round to activate special attacks or moves and put more effort into things. The card system itself, I've got a more mixed opinion on. It's certainly intriguing to use as an easy counter for encumbrance and fatigue, and that you can only have a certain amount of gear equipped and using effort cards, spells, etc. represents your dwindling strength and resources. On the other hand, there's no randomness regarding the decks, since all you have to do to access most of it is just to go ahead and deal it out when necessary. And while the various collectible card aspects of it are certainly clever, it implies a greater investment in the game than some might wish to be comfortable with, and really kind of relies on Nemesin being popular in your particular group. Further, assembling small decks of battle cards for monsters can be a little on the irritating side. It's not a bad idea overall, it's just one I personally am not entirely sold on. The magic system, which uses the various component cards to build spells, is really fascinating. I do like the ability to craft spells on the fly, and the mixing of various energy types and casting types can provide a fair detail with spell casting. Its reliance on the card system kind of puts it in the same level of meh for me on that, but aside from that minor detail, I actually really like it. About the only system I found innately awkward is the rogue skill portrait card system. I get what they're going for here, and providing a sort of mini-game to perform these skills uh, it looks like something I'd see in, in, in a computer role-playing game. It is different, I'll give it that, and it requires a quick wit on the part of the player, so it does reward player skill. My main issue with it is that it introduces a minigame element to a tabletop game that feels like it'd be more at home in a computer game, and that certain people may be much, much better at solving some of the problems in minigames than others, thus resulting in a sort of lopsided rogue. And at, at the end of the day, there's actually only so many por portrait cards for each difficulty. So if you play a rogue often enough, eventually you're going to memorize common portrait cards and their solutions. There's a secondary difficulty in that certain portrait cards pretty much require a certain combination of tools, and if you don't have them, you're just SOL. But I consider this less of a problem overall, simply because it reflects the brutal fact that if your character doesn't have the tool in question, you're not going to be able to perform the task anyway. That having been said, kudos for the effort, at least, in trying something different. So those misgivings aside, I find each system, taken on its own and independently, to be pretty decently interesting. You can tell a lot of work went into developing each one. And this is where those who have watched my prior reviews probably can begin to see my final real criticism of the game coming overall. See, I'm personally a fan of RPG systems with a lot of internal self-consistency in the rules even across rules for different sections. That's why I enjoy systems like Adventure Conquer, King, or GURPS. That's why I enjoy the core of the various 3.x iterations, but increasingly find later editions, especially in Fat Pathfinder, less satisfying. Because the more a subsystem disagrees with other subsystems in the same RPG, or the more it feels tacked on, the less I like it. And Nemesin RPG has a series of extremely interesting, well-developed systems that are very different from one another. Now, some people will embrace this as a way to differentiate between character builds and encourage different styles of play, and I totally respect that. It's just not something I particularly enjoy. So do I recommend it overall? Which is different than what do I think of it, you know, because I can think pretty highly of something and think it's not worth the effort, and I can think something's garbage, but still think you should pick it up. And the answer on this one is a strong maybe. I can see where a group who really gets into it will enjoy the way it plays, it makes for a bit of variety at the table and offers a quick way to play with a decent number of options, a lot of creativity and character builds, gritty combat, freestyle spellcasting, uh, rogue minigames, and basically a fair variety of playstyles to appeal to different types of people. It certainly plays differently overall than any other individual RPG that I've taken a look at so far, halfway between a tabletop game and some sort of card game. Price-wise, it's actually not too bad. You pay less for the core set than for the core books of some other tabletop games, and even if you invest in the cards, which aren't actually too badly priced, comparable with other collectible card games. And I suspect you won't really need to buy nearly so many packs of these to make a solid deck. The box set can be easily stashed in its storage box to keep all the various trinkets and handouts together, which is a plus. And I've stated it before, and I'll state it again, the world of Surratt, with its built-in system and its 
explanation and exploration through various online library pages, I think it's pretty good. I, th I honestly think it's really decent. So, Nemesin RPG does have a lot going for it, and a little bit going against it. If you can handle the rich issues that I raised earlier, then honestly, it's not a bad buy. It's, it's actually fairly reasonably priced, and you get pretty much everything you need for a reasonable amount. And there's nothing wrong with that. can't really argue with that. I'd mostly recommend it for groups that are willing to put in the effort to really nail the system down and perhaps buy enough cards to make sure that all the players have an appropriate deck which is something that the decks included in the main box set may not guarantee. If you've got more than two or three players beyond Fate, then they're, you're going to need to buy extra cards. At its core, Nemesin RPG is a system that seems to be a labor of love, as I said. The author has put a lot of work into it, and it shows. It has interesting systems, although it is about in need of polish, as you can expect of any first edition style of box set from an indie publisher. If that's the sort of thing that agrees with you and you want to change from your typical tabletop role-playing game's manner of play, it may well be worth taking a look at. At the very least, there are some lore and even a few adventures available in PDF format for free on the site, so you can take a look through them to get a sense of the style of the game itself. And on that note, I'm going to wrap it up here. For now, this has been the RPG Crawler with my look at Nemesin RPG. As always, I'll put a link to where you can pick it up in the description below. If you like what you've seen, remember to leave a like, comment if you got any feedback, and subscribe for more RPG content with tabletop and computer. Until next time, take care and goodbye.